the ninth annual convention of Al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition. Palestinian American poet, writer, and activist Remy Kanazi shares the struggles and concerns of the Palestinian people through his spoken word performance. I'm just going to start uh, with a poem called Coexistence. And I don't mean coexistence in the happy way we're existing here today. I mean in the BS CNN of Palestinians come to the table, give up 90% of their homeland, give up the right of return, stay in Bantu sands and ghettos and negotiate for the next 100 years. Then maybe Israel will have peace with them. I'm not really a fan of that, so I wrote this poem, Coexistence, as a response. Hi, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. I don't want to coexist. Not like good guys and bad guys and true lies and propaganda. Put on black faces, cab drivers, or deli owners in your racist comedies. Not bomb your Dunkin' Donuts with my kafia, fist pound Fox News, or let you steal my food and call it Israeli salad. I won't mess with the Zohan, or let them turn the rocks of Palestinian children into balloon animals, while Israeli soldiers snipe our children's heads, shoulders, knees, and stomachs. Hollywood snipes years of young ones with lovable tales of blue and white heroes. I'm not looking for your approval, not a token role or job on my knees scrubbing toilets in Israel's Congress. I'd rather fight with blacks and Latinos against oppression than concede to a mainstream plantation that sees me as other unless I'm checking a college application. I don't believe in the tooth fairy or 2,000 claims of homes you supposedly deserved when people resurrected and walked on water. I'll exist. In a world that fights against racism like Martin and Malcolm, please get old tales of Stephen Biko as a song that never dies, no matter what apartheid makes of our bodies, feeds mouths and Belfast streets, and resurrects Bobby Sands' message so that we'll never be hungry again. And whether you know it or not, I'm the best solution you have. One man asking for one vote, telling you to look at the sea, and I'll never drive you into it. I'll never return the favor. I'm not out stretching an olive branch and a rifle. I'm extending reality, because being surrounded by so-called enemies on your borders is easier than in your towns and election centers. We may not be brothers, but this neighborhood has made us cousins. I don't want to coexist. I want to exist as a human being. And justice will take care of the rest. As a Palestinian, I'm just as, as a born in Massachusetts, I'm just as American as anybody else. Um, and because I see, you know, this conflicting morality going on within our society, it, and, and I, I did have, uh, you know, a nice life, a comfortable life. I didn't grow up in a refugee camp. I think it's doubly important that I'm speaking out for people that are being bombarded um, by the U.S., unfettered support for Israel. Um, and these are the things that we need to be looking to. I want to thank Alauda for having me at this conference. It's really nice to, uh, to be a part of it. And um, I want to thank the organizers for, again, uh, having this conference out. It's important that we as Palestinians, young, old people who are in support, come out and, uh, and really stake our claim. Um, for so long, our narrative was written for us in the US. For so long, our voice was spoken for us in the US. So it's nice to reclaim that as a Palestinian who grew up in a small town in Western Massachusetts surrounded by 9,000 crazy white people. Um, I was a collective minority growing up and that was really weird. I was also a fat child, so that added to it. <laughs> Humanize. Um, so for me, it's if we don't do the movement, nobody will. If we're not engaged in boycott, divestment, and sanctions, if we're not organizing the flotilla, if we're not actually moving things forward, no one's gonna do it for us. So the next poem, has anybody ever heard, of, we're going to go angry again, has anybody ever heard of the Palestinian people should be more like Gandhi and Martin Luther King? Anybody ever hear that? Those people are stupid. It's okay, you can call them stupid. Unless you're a child, don't call them stupid because that might be rude. Um, so sometimes I write a poem and it's about somebody because it's like we have a conversation, you say something dumb, I write a poem in response. But sometimes I write a poem and then somebody says something dumb three months later. In this case, it was Bono. And Bono wrote in the New York Times, hey, if the Palestinian people could only be more like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And it's like, hey, Bono, if you could only be focused on making good music 30 years later, uh, you wouldn't be such an idiot. Yeah, the street has a name, Bono. It says you're wrong. Have a beautiful day. So this is called Like Gandhi, Like Martin. And this is a, a response to that type of ridiculousness. I was in the Arab American Comedy Festival. I think I'm funny, but I'm not. But, you know, I still try to pull a couple moves on stage. <laughs> Thing is, I had one eyebrow growing up, and now that it's two, when I get so angry, the brow furrows and it looks like one again, so I don't want to scare the children. I speak to a lot of mixed audiences, because you never really know what's going on. Not that I'm hating on one, because, again, that's part of who we are, and I love that. I embrace all of us. Um, so it's called, like, I'm like Martin. <laughs> and then we're going to get off the stage. We're going to walk through the crowd. 
I don't know if Palestine just hurts more than it used to, but I try not to think of the kids in Dehesha anymore. Great memories tucked under pillowcases, more nightmares brought by morning. Blink images of live-fired unarmed protesters, cameras spill out footage of screaming mothers, born, bred, dead in the West Bank, fought like Gandhi, like Martin, but no history book will remember their play. No one ever told me it would be this hard. Impossible to look away after first glance. I cringe every time someone sends me more photos. Dead babies, missing foreheads and frontal lobes. Policemen lay still, lined up like dominoes. Punctured chests where organs once functioned. Half a face missing in this one, an arm missing in that one. It looks like the bomb beat his little body into the ground. Read reviews of our art, movies, and music. We're so angry, one-sided, never fair and balanced. What about Schindler's List? The Pianist, Life is Beautiful, and every other Oscar-worthy and winning movie. I never looked at Jewish pain as something to conquer, never forgetting that monsters once lived under the skin of German men. We should be more like Gandhi, like Martin, like someone else. Pretentious armchair activists who obsess over Monica Lewinsky and Barack Obama's dog choice if we all just rose up at once. Like first and the bodice, people in the West forget about. Want to be feminist, peace activists and pluralists, swallow tongues and gouge out eyes. Wouldn't live this life for five minutes, but are too quick to criticize the way we live it. While a million Iraqi throats are slit, reporters sit in air-conditioned newsrooms praising General Petraeus. Don't dare ask Iraqi clouds what they've witnessed. It's quite a view from the ground outside the green zone. The fallacy put forth is that if we were only better, we would be free today. We should be better than the people that happen to be Israeli, happen to be Jewish, because better is not racial, ethnic, or religious, but situational. So for that, yes, we are better than you. We should be more like Gandhi, like Martin, and you should be more like F.W. Klerk, like Afrikaners admitting colonialism and white supremacy in South Africa. Funny that we always blame the victims and never ask the needed question. When is the day going to come when Israelis and other colonizers of the world better themselves? A lot of my early influences were, were less, you know, about like in, in the traditional sense, we look at like Mahmoud Darwish and Naim Shahab Naim, Ghassan Zaktan. Uh, and these are people who I couldn't admire, admire anymore. But you know, as a, as, a, as a kid growing up in Western Massachusetts, I was exposed to hip hop. So I lived Palestine through the civil rights movement. I lived Palestine through the anti-apartheid struggle. I learned Palestine through, you know, Tupac and Biggie, and before that, De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest, um, Indigable Planets and Common. I mean, these were my early inspirations. I had an older brother and an older sister who were really into music. and. You know, you hear the stories from your grandparents and you want to fight back. You want to give voice to a people that aren't being given voice, um, unfortunately, within the Western paradigm. And, um, you know, when I moved to New York City, I moved to New York City four months before 9 11. And I, I remember going to my roommate to like the local pool hall, and there was just such a vitriolic tone and there was so much anger and there was so much you know that Ann Coulter-ish kind of like we need to go and turn that place into a parking lot and I didn't know how to positively come back to those criticisms you know positively come back to that hatred and I said you know what like rather than just being so angry uh, and just and just responding with so much hatred backwards I read as much as I could you know I delved into progressive politics at the same time as I did Palestinian politics and I was in and that actually led my brother and sister to take me to go see Deaf Poetry Jams on Broadway. And that was the first time I saw Suhair Hamad perform live. Uh, and it was just to see somebody who captured so much beauty and eloquence and vigor and passion and life and reality um, was just mind-blowing. And I remember saying to my brother and sister, I want to do that. I want to go home and, and I want to write like that and I want to move an audience and I want to educate people and I want to go back and tell my friends, you know, this is what I think and this is why, you know, those crazy generalizations and those crazy monolithic statements about, you know, the Arab world or the Muslim world are so bogus. There are certain things that you can say about Palestine, there are certain things you can't say about Palestine because you don't want to come off as too brown or too radical or too Palestinian. So anyway, I wrote a sarcastic piece called The Do's and Don'ts of Palestine and, uh, no cell phones during this performance. Just kidding, person on the other end that heard that. Um, sorry. <laughs> so this is called the Do's and Don'ts of Palestine. 
And it's, it, it, I mean, a lot of times I'm responding to the mainstream propaganda and misconceptions, whether living in a post 9 11 world in New York City, I live in Brooklyn, I've been in New York for the last 11 years, or combating misconceptions about Arabs, about Muslims, about Palestinians, or talking about issues that are important about why we should be engaged in boycott, divestment, and sanctions, why we should be standing up against a corrupt Palestinian authority, why we should be standing up against Israel, um, and standing for the right of return, as this convention talks about a lot. So uh, this is called the Do's and Don'ts of Palestine. <laughs> don't call it genocide. We don't want to offend anyone. If we offend them, they'll never listen to us. We have to be reasonable. 1,400, just a number. No names, no death. We want peace and negotiations. Don't mention Zionism. If you mention Zionism, they'll call you anti-Semitic and people will believe them. Don't cite Palestinian sources. No one would believe you. I wouldn't believe you. Trust Israeli sources. Don't ever be angry, Abbas. If you're angry, they'll call you angry. If you're angry, well, everyone will call you understandably emotional. We have to be pragmatic. Pragmatism is not a euphemism for concessions, although it may feel that way. Don't mention Allah or martyrs. It reminds them of Al-Qaeda 9-11. It's not your job to fix their ignorance. Don't talk about refugees, boycott, or a one-state solution. If we want to win, we have to compromise. The road to peace is just ahead. Don't mention Haifa, Yaffa, Safed, or where your family's from. But if you do, nod when random people say they love Israel. It doesn't matter where you came from. You can't actually go back. Don't. Just don't. And that will lead to doing. <laughs> I always say to kids at shows, you know, freeing Palestine isn't a keychain you carry in your back pocket. It's something that you have to go out and proactively do. If you want apartheid to end, if you want occupation to end, if you want to see, you know, the right to return of all refugees, then you have to fight for those kind of things um, in all facets of facets of society. And that's what people are doing today through boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, through education, through, you know, uh, events throughout the country, fundraising, uh, and, and raising awareness. So I think those are the things that we really need, need to be focused on. If you'd like to learn more about um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, academic and cultural boycott, and what we can do, I always say, like, I talk, I perform at a lot of universities, and as much as I love another human rights report on Gaza, I know a lot of people in Gaza. I know the human rights abuses that are going on. And so, yes, we have the Goldstone Report. Yes, we have Human Rights Watch. Yes, we have Amnesty International. But what are we going to do about it? Now that 1,400 people have been slaughtered in 22 days, now that uh, East Jerusalem, they're kicking people out of their houses and firing tear gas canisters, now that they're hitting up nonviolent demos in the West Bank with live bullets and rubber bullets and tear gas canisters, what are we going to do about it? If we want the right of return, if we want equality for Palestinians living inside of the state of Israel, if we want, um, if we want an end to apartheid and occupation, and our government is giving 3.1 billion in aid, and our government is giving Hellfire missiles and Apache helicopters and cluster bombs and white phosphorus and UN vetoes, what are we gonna do about it? Writing another book isn't gonna end it. We have to take a stand and stand in solidarity with Palestinian civil society for boycott, that estimate, and sanctions. So that's why I'm here. Um, the next poem I'm gonna do is, I don't know, because I didn't really prepare that. Are there any Egyptians in the house? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, you got me on semantics. Um, so uh, I had to write a poem. Um, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. And this is, uh, this is to the people of Egypt. And then I'm just going to do a few more. And again, I urge you guys to come out to the workshops, to the luncheon, to the banquet. Reem is going to perform beautifully tomorrow night. Um, there are going to be a lot of amazing speakers. And it's important for us to be part of the movement. So this is uh, called Revolution. You were told, no. Stop complaining, keep your head down, walk forward, smile when spoken to. This is just how things are. It could be worse, it could be over there, it could be back the way it was, but it can't be what you're thinking. They're too powerful, too brutal, too supported by the West, Saudi, Israel, broker deals to keep you down and your resources out cheap. Don't stand up, resist, reject, must respect status quo that keep you imprisoned, you're outspoken, tortured, your economy pillaged in the US. Moderates, reinforced myths, working within a system that worked them into nicer houses, brought them $100,000 galas, and one-on-ones with war criminals who will be written about in the next edition of a people's history. The youth, 
rose up, labor, woke up, pessimists, former pan arabists and pragmatists reimagined worldview, took to squares, took over squares, chanting down with Ben Ali, down with Mubarak, down with the regime, rewriting conventional wisdom with a dreamer's pen. It is not too late. We are not free enough. He may be better than his father, but less evil is still evil. Ruled, squashed, pummeled, broken, backed up against walls, skulls, smashed, repainting sidewalks, stabbed in squares, scalped in dungeons, hung in courtyards. Historic presidents support the enslavement of oppressed peoples. Talk of a post-racist society as police brutality effaces dreams of black and Latino youth, creates a jail culture where victims are criminals and 400,000 families a year are broken up by reforming the packaging of ethnic cleansing. Egypt is the US-Mexico border, but Anderson Cooper will never tell you that on TV. Keep your head down is no longer a solution. From Tahrir to Wisconsin, people are redefining authority by asserting themselves and electing communities as leaders. We are the future. And that is not a campaign slogan, but a lifestyle that sees snapping fists as a catalyst to resistance, shaking off rulers, corrupt Arab neighbors, leagues of dictators, US imperialism, Israeli hegemony, and old guard dog egos who are bruised by their failures. Revolution doesn't come easy. The world is watching. Much of the world is working against you. Remember that. But you are a people's movement. Your resolve is a revolution. Much of the world is standing with you. Remember that. Luckily, I've always been strong and unabashed, so I haven't faced that much resistance. I mean, there's always going to be propaganda. You get hate mail. You get, you know, um, you just support hatred and terrorism and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it doesn't even matter that you're talking about, you know, things like the anti-apartheid struggle or combating racism or, I mean, that's what I think is is, is kind of mistaken with, with the Palestinian struggle is that at the end of the day, you're really just fighting for freedom, equality, and justice, and you shouldn't be ashamed of anything. So, you know, I'd, I'd have right-wing groups, um, you know, some schools, uh, their student governments wouldn't want to bring me out because they're like, he's a terrorist, or he supports terrorism, or he, you know what I mean? Like, all this kind of, uh, uh, this propaganda, but I mean, that's that's part of the, the fight, because if they can stitch our mouths shut, then they're winning half the battle. I mean, when... When we look at what's going on within Palestine, why are some of the most effective maneuvers, nonviolent protests have built in, or other measures are taking up, boycott, divestment, and sanctions? The more that the world comes together and is fighting positively for the Palestinian people, the more Israel and its supporters start to get scared. And I think it's something that nobody should ever be ashamed about. It's amazing, you know, we're talking about the right of return and we're talking to refugees, and I tell anybody, talk to refugees, I, I, it, it's a unique experience into a world of, of, of pain and brilliance all at the same time. And, you know, my grandparents were kicked out in 1948, and they fled to Lebanon. And my grandmother never felt at home in Beirut. She never felt at home in the U.S. Until her dying day, everything was yaffa, yaffa, yaffa. It was always about return. So to me, the right of return was never a question, because this was part of the core and the being. So um, I'm going to read a few of the three-line poems and then read this poem, Yaffa, and then end with a couple super-duper angry poems. Oh, isn't that awesome? I love angry. Okay. <laughs> so this, uh, just to give you like a style of what these, anybody see the, the, the missiles that said, with love in 2006 with the Israeli girls that were then used on the civilian population of Lebanon? So this is kind of a three-line poem response. Missiles said with love. I fall to where they hit. Charred limbs Stained tears, rotting corpses, no love in sight. Her tiny legs dangled over her, her, dot, her tiny legs dangled over her father's open arms like spaghetti strings, running blindly over, to, over rubble to anywhere but here. One bullet in the stomach, the other still lodged in her chest. She closes, she closes her eyes, smells the sea salt, caresses the soft sand, and takes in a deep breath, and feels the wind hug her arms as her father once did. For a split second, she imagines they've returned, where she was born, where she belongs. So um, this poem is called Yaffa, and it's for my Tate Delaney. She no longer recognizes my face, never will again, but can still smell her oranges, Feel the sun kiss her face as if on her balcony in Yaffa, 61 years later. 
described like the most magnificent villa, must have been seven stories tall, spanned half the neighborhood. Tree branches opened like arms so chunks could witness its beauty. I visited the house with my brother. Israeli cab driver said he'd never heard of the street. Palestinian presence must have made his memory fail. My grandmother was a painter, mostly landscapes. Now she can only describe them words like poetry, thoughts like scholars. No matter how much I read and write, I always feel like a student in the presence of refugees. My grandmother's waves came back. My grandmother's memories came back like Hudva's waves. The outside world may never mention their names, but the roots of olive trees will never forget what happened. This is called a letter, and I, so I used to be pragmatic because I didn't really know about much about politics when I was a kid. I wanted Coca-Cola and McDonald's, not Sviha and Tabula, and you know, then my mother slapped the wrong out of me. And uh, so this was a response to a lot of pragmatic people um, who stopped talking to me after I wasn't pragmatic anymore. So this poem is called A Letter. I'm writing you this letter to tell you that I can't talk to you anymore. Not in the way you want me to. We used to be partners in thought, hands outstretched, drinks thrown back, two peas in a pragmatic pot. If only others could see the way we did. But now your face contracts in grimaces, words you can't bear to hear, too harsh for your parents, too normal for mine. I sounded like a bitter refugee, pined on Yalfa, emotions of my grandmother, talk of return and immediate action. I crushed our dreams with rocks of reality, a wounded dove who could no longer swallow hypotheticals when teardrops flooded Gaza like tsunamis. I read so much Chomsky, I didn't want to return. Re-examine my identity after Saeed's The Question of Palestine. Finally recognize they need to read a book to be a humanist. Desmond Tutu, Cesar Chavez, Rosa Parks showed me the right of return through action. When I spoke of boycott, you dangled anti-Semitism over my head like blackmail. And how could I shut my art off to dialogue when I created art to start dialogue? But Zinn told me you can't be neutral on a moving train. MLK professed freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And Adrian Rich burned into my memory. The moment of change is the only poem. When I said we needed to act, you told me to write more poetry. When I said I wanted my poetry to bring action, you told me my poetry was action. But I come from a family of privilege, a sector of society that never puts its hand out and writes policy for the have-nots. I try to win hearts and minds, but found that the keys to the hearts were in their hands, opening doors to houses they still carry deeds for in Yaffa. I'm writing you this letter to tell you that I can't talk to you anymore. But if one day you want to meet again as equals, I'd be more than happy to show you why old men devastate backs and break bones to harvest their own lands. A Mediterranean sunset so magnificent, not even a settler's highest hilltop could imagine its beauty. I can show you perfection in bruised knees, the soft side of calloused palms. I can't show it to you in the way that you want me to. I can only show it to you in the way that it exists. I mean, I think there's always going to be a struggle. You're saying something that people, a lot of people, don't want to hear. Um, I always tell people that if if you didn't have 1,400 people being killed in Gaza, uh, if you didn't have occupation, if you didn't have dispossession, you wouldn't have to pick up the pen anymore. I mean, I, I'd like to think I'd make a pretty good lawyer. Um, so the obstacles, I mean, it's, it's, it's internal and external. You're always going to have people that want to kind of work against what you're saying. Uh, I mean, the Palestinian issue is the most contentious issue in America. I mean, I'm so inspired and touched by all the, the work the youth is doing. And I'm still, I'm 27 years old, I'm still part of that younger generation. You know, so every time you pick up a pen, you're not, you're not writing a poem for your ego, you're fighting for people, you know, and like it's corny or cliche or whatever as that sounds. Um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an honor that you're fighting for Palestine. Every time I think of 9-11, I see burning flesh stripping off the bones of Iraqi children in Fallujah, now Gaza. I tend to memorialize the forgotten, the eclipsing collateral damage of our unpunished crimes, and maybe it's because I'm a numbers guy. Because if I had a dollar for every time an Iraqi died since 2003, I'd be a millionaire. And don't get me wrong, sometimes I don't know who to hate more, the governments in the West or the politicians in the East who sell their souls quicker than the oil they export, strong men who use Palestine as a tool to line their pockets and don't give a nickel to their people. Quizzling governments who stitch mouth shut for check from Washington and APEC. How can you be their prototypical anti-Semite when you're signing peace accords to oppress your own people? 
And then Orientalists and idiots want to talk about how we can have democracy in the Middle East because of what happened in Gaza. A Hamas boogeyman wrapped in democratic elections. Rahm Emanuel wants to educate me and my people about democracy gone wrong. Why isn't he trying implementing one in Israel first instead of bowing down to terrorists like his father and the IDF, lauding a third-rate racist European society that's imploding quicker than its moral standing in the world? Enlightened, like 1950s Afrikaners and slave traders, just because a house is beautiful doesn't mean the bones you built them on have fully decomposed. The Israeli left is about as alive as Ariel Sharon. I'm sick and tired of asking for permission to resist from antiquated leftists and progressives who care more about keeping a kosher than moving things forward. I put down my pen and waving fist to resist with college kids and Palestinians, boycott and divest because honestly, who cares about preserving a living when governments are killing civilians? Complicity by silence and reserved units bombing Gaza. Your academics and scholars, theater groups and practitioners are part of the problem. And if logic doesn't fit into your long-term plan of rejecting my right to return, I'm sorry, maybe one day you'll return to reality where my people have babies quicker than Zionists can concoct Jordanian and options. I'm not looking for your sympathy or your introspective confessions. Won't sit on my hands until they lose oxygen like the people of Balad and Rafa. Vote for Barack Obama and pretend that his 22 days of silence was golden while emaciated children starved to death surrounded by their parents' corpses. This can't be America the beautiful. A criminal with a few positive attributes doesn't alleviate genocide. Bombing Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, it doesn't make you historic. It makes you as blind and bloodthirsty as the white men that came before you. Apathetic hipsters now excited about a president who broke history, but not poverty, occupation, or corporate interests. I'd rather proudly walk through the graveyards of peace accords and failed dialogue sessions than keep seeing my people just as occupied or third-class citizens. We're the gavel. They'll slam down like a verdict. I'm not waiting for Israel, America, the Supreme Court to approve it. We'll boycott Love Leviathan, Ahaba, and your apartheid companies. We're taking back the right of return and keys to a country because we never, never asked you to go back to Europe or sit in open-air prisons. I'm not asking for advice. I'm explaining the decision. You can stay here with us, but only as equals. It's not that you're Israeli. It's that you're wrong. That's why I fight for my people. Thank you.